company's the first thing, anyway. We are. Thank you. <laughs> I'll um, kick off. Roy, I have just 30 seconds ago been introduced to, to your vet and I, 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 I said to him, so you must have been Buster's vet. That must have been ferocious. Uh, he replied, in a vet's life nothing could ever have been more ferocious than Roy Hattersley's mother. <laughs> so so t tell, tell us a little bit about your mother. Well, my mother was the cleverest person in terms of native wit uh, I've ever known. Um, she, I know some very clever people, Tony Crosland, and Dennis Healy, but my mother was, in terms of native wit, cleverer than any of them. But she was totally uneducated, left school when she was 14. And she went through life bitterly angry that she had no education and didn't know things in the way she should have known things. And that made her go through life deeply disappointed in me for not doing as well as she would have done had she had, had, I had her chances. <laughs> Indeed, I confided to Matthew, and uh, I'll confide to you. Her last words were to Maggie, my wife, which were, I've never thought much about Roy, but I have to admit, he does look after his dog. <laughs> <laughs> which his last words go is pretty good, I think. <laughs> Your father was a priest. My father was a priest. Uh, he was a priest in, just outside Mansfield. Uh, he married my mother in that he performed the wedding ceremony for my mother and a minor. My mother was then part member of the Communist Party. Uh, about six weeks after she married this minor, also a member of the Communist Party, my father and she ran away together. Well, they didn't run away together, they bicycled away together. Uh, they were both children of Sheffield men. And Sheffield men know there's no one quite like Sheffield. And these two pathetic figures with no money and no prospects, no home, thought if they could get to Sheffield, everything would be all right. <laughs> well, it wasn't, but uh, they survived. And they survived, they lived happily ever after. Uh, well, I mean, the, personally, the greatest love story I've ever witnessed. When I was a boy of 15 and 16, they used to sit on the sofa holding hands. I used to be deeply embarrassed by this. Parents aren't supposed to hold hands. That's what people do with a younger age. Was it a happy childhood? Uh, it was, in many ways it was. In many ways it was. It was a happy childhood when I was playing cricket or football. Uh, it was, I, I, I was happy at school. Um, but it was a very solitary childhood because in my little book, <coughs> a Yorkshire Boyhood, the opening chapter is called Pulling Up the Drawbridge. I knew we were isolated from the rest of the family. I didn't know why. It wasn't until I discovered my father had been a priest that I realised that the Catholic section of the family had cut him off without a healing. So we lived knowing that we had relatives in Nottingham and parts of, the, parts of Nottingham, but uh, we never saw them and I was never quite sure why. Have you inherited your, your father's interest in or devotion to religion? I've... <laughs> it's a very interesting distinction. Why are you interviewing me? We're supposed to be talking to each other. You're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> the old habits die hard. This is a man's a professional interviewer, so he interviews. I'm a professional talker, so I talk. <laughs> um, make an interesting distinction between devotion to and interest in. I am fascinated by religion, by theology. I'm just completing a quarter of a million words on the history of the Catholic Church in Britain. I've uh, written a biography of John Wesley, a biography of the founder of the Salvation Army. Um, but I have no religion myself. I'm an atheist. I mean, I know when it's all up, it's all up. I don't expect to be reunited with my father in heaven um, any more than I expect to any of the other things that religion offers. But the idea of it fascinates me, even though I can't believe it myself. What about you, Matthew? Well, now ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask you a much more sinister question than you've asked me. You've been very kind to me. Uh, so far. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking of the first time I'd heard the name Matthew Parrish. Um, these days, we're, you're thought of as an amiable, intellectual, reasonable, moderate, logical man who's always on the middle ground, if there's a middle ground in the Tory party. Um, but when I first heard of you, you were a hate figure. A hate figure in the Labour Party and outside. It was something about a letter you wrote. Tell us about the letter you wrote that made you a hate figure. I worked in Mrs. Thatcher's office when I was about 27, uh, 28. Uh, my, I was her correspondence clerk. My, my job was to answer her letters from the general public, of which she was receiving be between 
700 and in one week 5,000 every week she was leader of the opposition. And I worked very hard, I had more to do than one man alone could do and late one night I came upon a letter to her from a woman in a council house in Kent and uh, Mrs Collingwood was her name. She the name is engraved on your heart, is it? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> she wanted Mrs Thatcher to know that she didn't like her council house. She didn't like it because living next door to her was a family with um, a child with Down syndrome that made a noise and she could hear the disturbances from the child and she didn't see why she should live next door to a child like that and she didn't like the fact that there were some, as she put it, coloured people uh, living in the same council estate. Why, why should they have uh, council accommodation and what are you going to do about it Mrs Thatcher? I was tired, it was late. Um, <laughs> I wrote one of those letters, well these days I, we would compose one of those emails and not ping the send button until the next morning. I should not have signed the letter for dispatch until the next morning but basically it just said dear Mrs Collingwood um, replying on Mrs Thatcher's behalf to your letter, sorry you don't like your council house, you should be grateful to have a house, a roof over your head, provided at the ratepayers and the taxpayers' expense. Yours sincerely, Matthew Paris, private office of the leader of the opposition. And she gave it, I now know, to her husband. He gave it to his shop steward. He gave it to his trade union. Uh, they gave it to the Labour Party. The Labour Party sat on it until the eve of the election in 1979. <laughs> and, and um, gave it to the Daily Mirror. The Daily Mirror published the letter on its front page. The Labour Party printed three million leaflets of the front page of the Daily Mirror. They were delivered through every door of every council property and every marginal seat in Britain. I was called into Mrs Thatcher's office to explain and she looked at me then with an expression that she since looked at me so many times. Um, <laughs> with the head slightly to one side, and an expression not of anger, but of bemusement. There's something not quite right about this boy, was what her, uh, her eyes said. And I should have known then that I would never get a job in her government when I became an MP. So uh, we, I jolly nearly lost my um, candidature in this, this constituency but didn't quite, and, and survived, Roy. And this is whetted everybody's appetite for the great question about working for Mrs. Thatcher. I mean, did you enjoy working for Mrs. Thatcher? Did you like her? Did you get on with her? And I don't think anybody, except perhaps Dennis, and a few people very <laughs> close to her, would, would speak of liking or loving her. I admired her, and admire her memory very much indeed. Uh, it, it is wonderful working for someone who really knows where they're going, uh, what it's all about, what they want to do, what they want you to do. Anybody in any organisation, and I was a very junior person in her office, will know what it's like to be inspired by a real sense of leadership. I suppose I didn't always agree with her, but I, I, I admired her sense of direction and I also liked the way she took great care with her staff. She was extremely unpleasant, uh, uh, rude. She behaved very badly to her her equals, but she never behaved badly to her inferiors. So yes, I did like working for her very much. And part of your relationship, you've talked about my dog, you had a dog in your relationship with Mrs Thatcher. <laughs> yes. I... You see, I'm working my way to writing his biography. You see what... <laughs> <laughs> I, um, going home late after right, working in Mrs Thatcher's office one night, it's a long story, but I jumped into the River Thames to rescue a drowning dog. And um, I, I, it wasn't courage. I was born and brought up in Africa. I had no idea how cold an English river is uh, in, in February. And uh, I very nearly drowned, but I did just rescue the dog. And uh, the little boy and girl and their mother and father told the RSPCA. The RSPCA told Mrs Thatcher. She called me into her office again, again with that expression, there's something not quite right about this boy. <laughs> told me I'd been a damn fool to rescue the dog, that it was only a dog, I should have let it drown. Uh, but she said it would be a good um, opportunity for the media if she was to present me with the RSPCA's uh, award for bravery. Uh, so, uh, and it is said that when this um, 
constituency were looking for a candidate. Uh, some 480 people applied. The chairman of selection was the uh, district councillor for Kerbo. Uh, uh, some of you may remember Mona Gillen, a wonderful person. And um, Mona, as chairman of selection, said, well, ladies and gentlemen, we, we, we've shortlisted, we need to shortlist down to 12. We've decided on 11. We can't decide on our 12th. Uh, um, this young man, he isn't, he's only a clerk in the leader's office, but he's rescued a dog. I love dogs. I'd love to shake his hand. Why don't we have him? And they all said, all right, we'll have him. And um, that's, that, that's why I, I am interviewing you here today, Roy. The dog mis am I wrong in thinking the dog misbehaved himself in Downing Street? The, the, the dog tried to mate with Mrs. Thatcher's leg on, on Westminster Bridge. Uh, I, 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 I do think there are some quite important hardwired differences between men and women. One of them being that a woman can pretend that nothing awful is happening when something awful is happening in a way that I think no man is ever capable of, of doing. And the, the photographs in the press only showed the top half of Mrs. Thatcher and it was smiling and waving to the camera, the, the hair absolutely perfect. The most appalling indignity was occurring to her leg, but you, you would never have known. The, the, the caption in the Sunday Express was, hold on Jason, which the dog was certainly, certainly doing. Now Roy, um, what first attracted you to, to politics as a, as, a, as a boy? Political family. Um, mm. 1945, I took the 11 plus. You took exams in the morning, two mornings, had the afternoon off to recover. I came home to 101 Edio Road, Wadsley, Sheffield 6, expecting to go on Wadsley Common and play cricket with my friends. And I was told I wasn't going to do that, I was going to deliver leaflets for Mr. A.V. Alexander, First Lord of the Admiralty and Labour candidate. And I was entranced by the idea of it. I mean, I knew I was Labour because I was a Hattersley. I was entranced by the excitement of politics. And I remained that I would be 11 then for the next seven years. I knew I was Labour without knowing quite why I was Labour. Then in the summer of whatever it was when I was 18, doing some work in the summer holiday in the hope of getting a scholarship, which I didn't get, um, the history master at my grammar school had me at his house during the summer holidays and recommended books to read. Kitto <coughs> the Greeks, Arlene Powers, Medieval People, and R.H. Tawney's Equality. And once I read Equality, I knew that's what I believed, that's what I was about, and that's what I wanted to do. It sounds terribly pretentious, but uh, what I wanted to, life, to devote my life to pursuing. I am an egalitarian. I have been throughout my political life. I still am. And that's a direct result of reading R.H. Tawney's Equality when I was 18. Yes, but there will be many people in this audience who have also read uh, tracts of ideology, political belief, and felt, yes, that's me, that's what I believe. But it isn't quite the same thing as to decide that you want to be a member of parliament. You, you want to be the person, one of the people who puts those ideas into... It's a combination of two things. I was interested in the mechanics of politics, interested in the excitement of politics. Heaven help me, interested in the theatre of politics. And then when there was an idea behind it as well, the two things together became irresistible. Hmm. Not that I, in the end, enormously enjoyed the mechanics of politics. I was never a House of Commons man. I was never a House of Commons man in the sense that, say, Dennis Skinner is, who lives for the procedures of the House of Commons. Indeed, I found the House of Commons rather tedious, as I suspect you did during your brief time there. Yes. You didn't enjoy it at all. No, I didn't. No, no. I, I, I did find the House of Commons quite tedious. I, I, I found all the rules and I found all the play acting rather, rather ridiculous. The, th the thing that is objective about the House of Commons is the theatricality of it all, the bogusness of it all. The, and heaven helps me, to, I'm supporting the Scottish National Party, but all the right honourable gentleman stuff, even worse than the House of Lords. Will the, will the noble peer remember? You know, all that stuff is awful, awful, awful. Um, and so the House of Commons became, a, in a sense, a thunderbolt may strike me for saying this, a vehicle a vehicle for my political ideas, the way in which the political ideas were put into operation. Or not, as it takes me most of my life. In, in those days, when you were in your 20s and early 30s, you had your political ideas. The Labour Party, it, within the Labour Party, there was a huge battle for ideas. Which side were you on in, in those battles? No, I was a Gateskillite. Um, I've always had a weakness for heroes. And one of my heroes was Hugh Gateskill. My great abiding hero, as well as my great abiding friend, was Gatesville's heir, Tony Crossland. And I was what was then called a revisionist, which said, we need to maintain our principles, which were for Hugh Gatesville and for Tony and for me, 
I believe in greater equality, but we need to apply them to modern circumstances, changing as you go on. And I mean, I made my name as a hardline right winger. I won't describe, I won't repeat some of the ways it was described in those days, by supporting Gatesville over nuclear disarmament. I was deeply opposed to nuclear disarmament. Um, and I think the first time I appeared in a national newspaper was supporting Hugh Gatesville when he was in trouble with it over the Labour Party conference. Did you encounter another famous uh, local MP, although not really from th this area, Tony Benn, of course you encountered him, but did you, did you ever clash with him personally? I tell you why, I, I, I think he's rather... The, the short answer to that question is yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I rather like Tony, um, because Tony had a sense of humour. And in the dark days of the winter of discontent and so on, when sense of humour had something to commend it. I remember the last day of a cabinet meeting, we had eight cabinet meetings in 12 days, trying to find the money to to convince the IMF we were taking the economy seriously. And we went round the table for the last time, and I said, well, I can find 12 million pounds here, and someone said, no, 50 pounds here. And Tony Benn said, we'll never solve these problems until we have a overthrow of the present capitalist system, until the workers are in control, until we probably... And Jim Callan, the Prime Minister, introduced him and said, Secretary of State, this is not a contribution to debate, it's simply a statement of socialist principles. And Tony said, I wish to plead guilty and ask for another thousand offences to be taken into consideration. <laughs> <laughs> and it immensely lightened the atmosphere. And another occasion, um, during those eight cabinet meetings, um, I lost my temper with Tony. Tony suggested something ridiculous. And I said, that's the most stupid thing Tony Benn's ever said. And Dennis Healy said, oh, Roy, he said, oh, I often agree with you, but I can't. I've heard him say even more stupid things than that. <laughs> And for 10 minutes, the cabinet had a discussion about what was the most stupid thing Tony Benn ever said. Until Jim Cullen intervened and said, this is far too serious a subject to be discussed ad hoc. Someone's got to write a paper about it so we can discuss it seriously. Now, Tony f fitted in with that. But Tony Crossland, who used to call him Jimmy, I'm not sure why, but it was Jimmy, said, Tony Benn's OK, except he's cracked. And there was a certain sort of madness about him. He would say things which were palpably nonsense, um, but genuinely believe them. In his office, throughout his time in the cabinet, he had a map of Britain hung upside down to convince us that the South was as important as the North. Well, it is, but that didn't prove it. So, uh, so it was a slightly crazy attitude. You had 25 tries to get a parliamentary constituency, is that right? 20, 25 when I stopped counting. <laughs> um, it was difficult days. I mean, these days, young men who want to get a seat nudge out the elderly member of parliament and fight their way in. In my time, you had to wait for him to die or resign. And uh, I went to many places which either didn't short most of me or didn't select me on the shortlist. I was very lucky to get Sportbrook. I was shortlisted for Sportbrook on one Sunday. On the previous Sunday, I was shortlisted for Eads, Leeds South East, which was Hugh Gatesville's constituency, which was a safe seat, a by-election, and Hugh Gatesville's constituency. I thought, I'm not going to waste my time in Sportbrook, I'm going for Leeds. And uh, I said to the people in Birmingham, I'm not coming to Birmingham. They said, it'll look very bad if you don't come. You're not going to be selected in Sparkbrook. Just come, get turned down, then you can have Leeds the following week. So I went to Sparkbrook and got selected. <laughs> and had my doubts for a moment until I went to Leeds and said, by the way, I'm not coming. And they said, that's a good thing, because it wasn't going to be you anyway. It was going to be Merlin Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a piece of immense good fortune, which I have, I mean, I've had immense good fortune for the last 40 years. I'm trying to call to mind the young man that you will have been then. We see you now as a venerable figure with an Edwardian, dare I say, Corbynite beard. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> I, want, I want you to know what a rat he really is. Because as we came in, I said, you can call it anything except Corbynite. I said that to him on the way in. <laughs> but describe the young, the young Roy Hattersley, the, the, the young, slim, shaven, Roy Hattersley, <laughs> what, what, what sort of a character were you? Were, were you a kind of bounding puppy dog full of enthusiasm? Were you, uh, were you a, a quiet and studious character? Describe yourself as you were then. Well, I was always more nervous than I made myself out to be. I was always immensely optimistic. Um, I always thought things were going to turn out OK next time round which was necessary when the Labour Party in my time was one long period of disaster. I mean, in my 33 years in the House of Commons, 27 of them were spent in opposition, 23 of them were spent in opposition. 
Um, but I always thought things would be all right next time. So the optimism, uh, I think, saw me through. Also, the other things I was interested in, I could never bring myself to be an ex-soldier politician. When Neil Kinnock whapped me, he didn't just beat me, he beat me by three to one for the leadership of the Labour Party. He said to me, it's not just that you were on the right and I was on the left, it's that you haven't taken the job seriously. You write for newspapers, you read books, you go to the theatre. Well, yes. Um, so I was always that person who wanted to do other things as well, which is probably a disadvantage in modern politics when you've got to be wholehearted, heart and soul, nothing else matters except getting on in the job. I, one more question, and then I, I, I perhaps should, should answer one, but um, I, you, you, you say that Neil Kinnock slightly looked askance at the idea that you did all these other things, that you had another life, that you had a hinterland, but the Labour Party, until relatively recently, had many such men and women. Uh, look, look at uh, Dennis, Den uh, Dennis Healy, uh, for instance. Look at Crossland. Look at so many of them. They, 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 they knew history. They knew literature. Uh, they wrote. Uh, they, they had depth. Um, and, and you are actually a, a particularly outstanding example of that. What is happening to modern politics that we don't have such men and women any longer? Well, it's become a job for professionals. I mean, when I got in the House of Commons, there were 20 people in the House of Commons who were regular first-class journalists. I mean, proper journalists. I don't mean did odd jobs on the subject of politics, but were writing columns from major newspapers. And people who wrote books. Um, mostly on the Labour Party side, I have to say. I mean, it was John Stuart Mill who said, by definition, the Tories are the stupid party. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was always a certain feeling that the Conservative Party weren't as intellectual as the Labour Party, which was sometimes a disadvantage. But what's happened is the complaint we hear from all sides, that a certain sort of professionalism is taken on. You leave university, you become a political assistant, a political advisor, a special advisor, you go into politics, and you've done nothing else except that. By the time I got into the House of Commons, I'd been a management trainee in the steel industry, which wasn't very successful. I'd worked for adult education, a job which was part WA, part XML department of the university. And I'd worked for the health service as an administrator, so I had some experience of the world outside. And these days, that just doesn't happen. If you look at both sides of the house, cabinet and shadow cabinet, it's full of people who've been politicians since they left university. I think that's a great disadvantage to the House of Commons, a great disadvantage to Parliament. Did you want to be, did you want to be a minister from the start? I wanted to be a minister from the day I got into the House of Commons. Um, there's no point in being in the House of Commons if you're going to be backbencher of your life. You, you can be a successful backbencher. I mean, Tam Diel made things change by being a backbencher. But uh, what you really want to do is have your hands on the lever of power. Of, uh, and that means getting into the cabinet, not just being a junior minister. <coughs> the role of a junior minister is sometimes very depressing. Um, I was junior minister to Barbara Castle, to Tony Crossland, to Jim Cullen, to Dennis Healy. And working for Dennis Healy and Tony Crossland was a delight. Working for Barbara Castle was a catastrophe. <laughs> she used to poke me all the time, call me boy, boy. <laughs> yeah, boy. Uh, I, I must ask you something, but I must, can't resist telling this question. I left her to become Minister of Defence. It was a very high sounding job, number two, Dennis Healy. And she said this was a terrible mistake because my career would have been much better had I remained her pupil and for the rest of my life. <laughs> and she gave a party to uh, say goodbye to me. And for years beforehand, she always said to me, listen to me, boy, I'm old enough to be one of those. Listen to me, boy. I'm old. At the end of the party, she walked out with her hand around me and said, you'd make a terrible mistake leaving me, you know. I said, of course I know, Barbara. You're old enough to be you're my mother. She hit me as hard as she could. <laughs> and said, you'll never say that to me again. <laughs> Rather like Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> but let's go to your next experience. You've been through a lot of other interesting things. When you were Brian Walden's successor on the television programme. Did you enjoy that? No. No, I, um, I left the House of Commons after seven years as the MP in this constituency. I left the House of Commons uh, because I was offered a job presenting Weekend World, which was Brian Walden's Sunday morning programme. It was ITV's equivalent, really, of the Andrew Marr programme on the BBC. And uh, some of you look nearly old enough to remember Brian Walton, who he was, he was one of the great stars of his age. He was a, an idiosyncratic character, very much of a, a Midlands accent, 
And I interrupt you to say they said about him, he's a great friend of mine, they said about him what Hollywood said about Errol Flynn. You can rely on Brian Walden, he'll always let you down. <laughs> well, that suits you for a career in the media, I would have thought. And I was to be the new Brian Walden. And uh, I, I, television didn't get on with me. I didn't get on with television. I, I think you need to be a little bit of a sort of cardboard cut-out caricature of yourself to succeed in, in television. I, I was always reasonably quick-minded. I could read the auto cue and uh, reasonably fluent, but I, I, don't th I don't think I, I was the sort of Robin Day, Esther Ranson, Jeremy Paxman sort of character that everybody remembers. And so I led Weekend World to an early grave. Uh, on another occasion, I'll tell you about the other six careers I've failed at, but <laughs> this is probably not the right one. I, I want to ask you a serious question. We've had a good deal of fun, but a serious question about you and your background. Um, I can't remember you in the House of Commons, because you were a rare appearance and you didn't last very long. <laughs> but people say, people say you made one of the most important and heroic speeches in the history of our time in the House of Commons. I remember you being at my house and Christopher Price MP says you missed this speech, which was the great occasion of his entire political life. Tell us about that speech. You know the one I mean. Uh, yes, that, that was, I think, in 1984. It was very late at night, and if you want to keep a secret, make a speech in the House of Commons late, late at night, and it was on the extension of the law on homosexuality, which in those days uh, allowed homosexual relations between consenting adults over 21 in private. And th that law applied to uh, England, it applied to Wales, we had extended it to Scotland, uh, we had not extended it to Northern Ireland because the Northern Irish resisted very strongly. Uh, we, that's the UK government, then lost a case the, before the European Court of uh, Human Rights and we were obliged to extend it to Northern Ireland. I think the truth is the British government was very pleased to have an excuse and to blame it on, on Europe uh, because it was absurd that one, one of the provinces of the United Kingdom was so different from the others. I, I made a very short speech, which was supposed to be my coming out speech. I, I, I suppose everyone knew I was gay. I was president of the Conservative Group for Homosexual Equality, and I was always um, speaking in debates and things like that out, outside the House. But I'd never really directly addressed the issue in the House of Commons, so I just said that I, this was an issue on which I felt deeply, um, extremely strongly, and rather personally, and when one feels as personally as one does, um, one tends to, uh, it, 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 far from giving wings to one's argument, it tends just to trip one up, so I would just limit myself to saying that I, I supported this measure with all my heart. There was almost nobody in the House of Commons at the time, except Jim Pryor, who was then the Employment Minister, who wrote me the nicest letter uh, the next day. And I thought, that's, that's it, the, the roof is going to fall in now, uh, it'll be all over the press the next morning. Uh, but uh, there was nothing. I don't think any journalist had read the speech. So having sort of tried to come out, I kind of edged back in again. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of coming out, didn't you mention Peter Mandelson? Oh, that was, that was, um, <laughs> why is he going through all the embarrassing things in my, <laughs> my life? I, I'm making up for the Corbyn beard. I'm making up for the Corbyn beard. <laughs> I, uh, I was um, a bit on the Jeremy Paxman's Newsnight programme, and uh, I think uh, uh, Labour Minister the, the, uh, Davis, Wales, yes, the Secretary of State for Wales had got into various uh, difficulties um, and uh, <laughs> of a possibly sexually related nature. And uh, I, I, I said to Jeremy, well, there are, I think there are two or, th or three gay members of the, the cabinet, and uh, I don't think it's any problem with any of them. And, and uh, I, 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 who did I mention? I mentioned Chris Smith, and I can't remember if I mentioned any of the others, but he then said, and, and who else? And I said, well, I, uh, P Peter Mandelson, uh, 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 he's, he's gay, and I, I well, he, he is, and everybody knew he was, and it, he, he'd featured on the front pages of newspapers seven or eight years earlier before he was in the House of Commons, and, and so I really did suppose that it was well known, and it, 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 apparently half of Britain thought everybody knew it, and the other half of Britain didn't know it at all, and they, the press made a huge row, 
Uh, Jeremy Paxman cycled that night to Peter Mandelson's house to deliver a handwritten letter <laughs> saying he was very sorry this had happened on his program and it was nothing to do with him. Um, <laughs> the, the, which, it, which it wasn't. Peter believed, and I think probably still believes, that, that, I, that Jeremy had put me up to that, but he absolutely hadn't. I just blurt things out. <laughs> I thought it was obvious. And uh, he, the BBC then banned um, all its staff from mentioning Peter Mandelson's homosexuality. Uh, and uh, I, as far as I know, that ban is still in place. It's never been uh, rescinded. It, it was a really strange episode, episode in which I realised something about the media, which is that you can break a story a second time if enough people have forgotten the first time that it was broken. I, I, I regret doing it. I regret because it embarrassed Peter Manson. I really didn't mean to embarrass him. Using a story a second time leads us naturally onto your journalism. Uh, I mean, you became a journalist as your third occupation, so to speak, but now I guess you're the most successful journalist in Britain. How did you come to change, to make an absolute step change and become a journalist? Well, I, uh, firstly, and it's definitely not the most successful journalist in Britain, but um, I, 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 I've certainly come on a bit uh, from when I started. And I started at the age of 39, having failed at Weekend World. Weekend World was axed. Uh, I, after two years, I was axed, the programme was axed, we were all axed. But you got your teeth changed, didn't you? Uh, yeah, oh yes, yeah, so they made me. Weekend World, I used to have crooked front teeth, which I liked. Weekend World said you can't have crooked front teeth on television. Uh, I, they said, you must have them fixed. I said, I don't want them fixed. They said, you must have them fixed. They virtually frog marched, marched me to a dentist who fixed the front teeth. So I then claimed the, or rather, the Inland Revenue then tried to tax me on the benefit I had received from having my teeth <laughs> fixed. It, it was quite a celebrated case, apparently, but, but um, my accountant won and I was never paid the, the tax. So, yes, I was out of a job at the age of 39. I had a mortgage to pay and the then editor of the Times, Charlie Wilson, contacted me and said, how about writing an amusing little account of the day's proceedings in the, the House of Commons for us? And I thought, this is a bit of a come down. I was a member of Parliament. I was a frontline television presenter on LWT's flagship TV programme. And now I'm just going to write an amusing little column in the Times about the day's proceedings in the House of Commons. But I needed the money. So I took the job. And it just went really well. And it went well, I think, uh, because I perhaps share the same alloy of feelings about our politics and our constitution as you do, Roy. We know it's absurd. Uh, we know that there are a lot of absurd people. We know there's a lot of vanity. We know there's a little bit of corruption. We quite enjoy pricking the pomposity of the whole thing. But we have a sort of underlying respect uh, for the operation, an underlying respect for our constitution and underlying respect for the way we handle democracy in Britain. So I think a combination of, of ir irreverence and uh, uh, occasionally uh, a downright rudeness in reporting the House of Commons with an understanding that Times readers knew uh, that, that basically I believed in what we were doing uh, at Westminster maybe, maybe made it work. You, you represent my view of the political process exactly. But I have a count codicil. I mean, you were what was called, and is called, a sketch writer. Mm. Sketch writing seems to me not to be a trade for grown-ups. It seems to me to do an immense damage to the House of Commons and politics. It's under a certain amount of damage to Lord Hassley. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I've been a politician, <laughs> there we are. Uh, it's also done me in some things, occasions. One in 20 times, it was decent. Um, but don't you think that politics should be reported more seriously than it's reported now? No, I do not think politics should be reported more seriously. If it were reported more seriously, nobody would read our reports. Uh, the sketches, the knockabout in, at Prime Minister's questions, we all love to deplore it. We do deplore it. It's appalling. But it's, it, people watch. It, it's the way lots of people who don't take much interest in politics notice that there is politics in this country. I, I, I can't say I approve of the pantomime, but I think to have the pantomime is better than to have... My family live in Spain, a lot of them. Nobody knows what's going on in the, the Spanish Parliament at all. It's hardly reported. Nobody watches uh, the proceedings on television. It's all regarded as very, very distant and, and very, very dull. Our politics is lively. Uh, it engages people and I, sometimes I think they see and hear things that matter. 
and there's somebody waving to me to suggest that now is the time for uh, a little bit of a break. Can we have a break, Roy, and come back to this? As long as I can say I disagree with you, then we'll call it a day. <laughs> Tell me why you disagree first, and then we'll call it a day. Because I actually, th I mean, I've, I've enjoyed the knockabout of politics. I, when I got the chance to do Prime Minister's Questions, when Neil Kinnock didn't do it, uh, I loved doing it in a most knockabout comical fashion, or tried to do. Uh, the farce of politics appeals to me, the robustness of politics appeals to me, but also politics is a noble business. It is not represented as that in any way during our newspapers. When I was a young member of Parliament, there was a sketch written by very accomplished people, but there was also an account of what happened, so anybody who wanted to know what happened could read about it. Prime Minister's question time this afternoon, is it Wednesday? Yes. Nobody in this audience will know tomorrow what was done at Prime Minister's question time. If they happen to be on holiday, they may look at it on television, they'll be horrified by the noise and the furore and the lack of intellect and lack of balance, but they won't know anything more about politics than they did before they switched on. And I think that's a fundamentally bad thing. But a fundamentally good thing is if we have a break, we'll be back quite soon. Yeah. <laughs>